Determining the difference between animal trace fossils and root structures is very challenging, mainly because the morphology of fossil root systems are more complex and difficult to understand than that of animal trace fossils. However, root traces are some of the very rare possible plant trace fossils that have been discovered. By definition, root structures are the configuration of a plant's various roots, and trace fossils are defined as impressions made on a substrate by an organism, such as footprints and feeding marks. In 2010, a workshop on crustacean bioturbation revealed findings of two types of branch structures. One is described as horizontal to slanting, and the other as vertical. The initial interpretation was that these structures were animal trace fossils. However, following extensive observation, iconologists determined that both animal traces and root traces maintain features that resemble each other. As you can see, figure 3 represents a root structure and figure 11 represents a trace fossil, yet these are visible similarities. Root-related structures were discovered in southern Italy, and they have challenged ecologists as they attempt to interpret if there is an association between root structures and trace fossils. The findings determine the age of the study site to be from the lower Pleistone, and the geological setting is the Calcarnites area of the Fagnana Island, primarily consisting of calcarmites that have been quarried since the Roman times. The specimen suggests that the soil moisture and fluctuating water tables like those found near the study site were dominant. The discovery of the branch structures raised the question, is there an association between root structures and trace fossils? In this particular study, two root structures were recognized and three typical animal trace fossils were recognized. The specimens were prepared using standard methods and identified by comparison with other specimens. One of the root structures was identified as favira dukes, and they are described as generally horizontal, straight, slightly winding, tubular structures with a thick wall, as illustrated in the different views from this image. The next image highlights six additional views of the branch specimen, including an oblique view of enlarged tubular shapes and diagram E, and a cross section with a distinct wall in diagram F. The study determined that this particular structure could be related to tarp roots, which are straight, tapering plants that grow downward, forming a center from which other roots sprout laterally. The study also revealed that Favardriaxx Co., which existed with common trees fossils on these islands, but the morphology expressed in the diagnosis is unique and different from other possible trace fossil candidates in this specified area. Though they resemble large crustacean burrows, neither form displays a granular wall or a meniscate filling, which are typical features of animal burrows. Additionally, Farvidixes are structures that deeply penetrate marine deposits that contain marine macrofossils and trace fossils. Since the surfaces were high enough to keep the water table at a depth of at least 1.5 millimeters, the roots were allowed to live in the well ox oxygenated ground. Therefore, Farvastixis is one of the rare root traces that can be considered a plant trace fossil. Furthermore, the analysis from the Fagnana Island study indicates that root structures qualify as trace fossils because they are structures of recurrent shapes, resulting from deformation of the substrate by a living organism. However, the taphonomy of a plant's roots is poorly understood and fossil record classification is still underdeveloped. Therefore, ecologists and paleontologists continue to waver when interpreting plant root structures and hesitate to classify them as trace fossils. An introduction to invertebrate trace fossils. Trace fossils of both infaunal and epifaunal invertebrates were discovered in the eastern cave of South Africa. The fossils were found in an upper Middleton strata consisting of mainly sandstone that perfectly preserved them. This finding shed light on the fact that anoxia may have been present in the oceans during this time, and therefore the levels of the bodies of water must have had to have been deep enough so that sunlight did not reach the bottom. The way the trace fossils changed over time showed a strategy developed by the species to survive with high anoxia and low food levels. The patterns of trace fossils show the behavior of the species. By examining the trace fossils, investigators discovered that there was periods of sporadic movement followed by periods of little or none at all. This could correlate to the shifting of waters in the area or perhaps periods of geographical change that caused the fossil record to be disturbed. 
The evidence that is presented shows the levels of bodies of water and the way of life of many burrowing invertebrates in this region of South Africa. The site was to be found from the middle to upper Permian. It was actually a Middleton Lake, which is a non-marine environment that was deposited by the overflowing of streams nearly 260 million years ago. Figure 1. The taxon at the Middleton site are simple low diversity and low abundance organisms. The trace fossils are from Conichus anginus, an invertebrate grazer, and Undichna britannica, a swimming fish from part of a Sabaquis mermia ichnophosis. The question being tested consists of if the seafloor bioturbation, which is the reworking of soil by the organisms of fine grained sand layers, is a resultant from life activities of shallow funnel and epifunnel invertebrates. The analysis conducted includes checking the depth of lakes and seeing if stratification could occur. This means that there could be a development of poor levels of oxygen and nutrients at the bottom. The methods used to test the question involve examinations of sandstone and other strata of rock, as well as excavation of the area where the Middleton strata was first. The findings at the site include ripples in the sand and fossils occurring on the upper bedding. These fossils may be potential records of the mass extinction event hypothesized to have occurred at the end of the Middle Permian. Therefore, current findings provide a further paleoenvironmental piece to the overall information of this biocrisis. Figure 2 and 3 show the ridges and cracks that are preserved in the sandstone. These are the trace fossils that the organisms made as they moved along. Notice how in figure 3a versus 3b, the cracks and ridges are highlighted. Table 1 shows the diameter, amplitude, and wavelength of the trace fossils left behind by the two different types of organisms found at the site. Results of the analysis show that this site potentially records effects of the Keptinian mass extinction. Research at this location could lead to knowledge of organism adaptation strategies 260 million years ago. The research revealed that the organisms most likely lived during a period of heavy rains and high oxygen, followed by anoxic dry conditions preserving the trace fossils. This shows changes in the climate during this time period that could unlock clues about how life occurred 260 million years ago. Concluding thoughts on the analysis include evolutions are seen with food scavenging and finding stable energy resources among organisms. The changing weather conditions is also shown in the stratigraphy, meaning connections between organism life and climate can be inferred. The evolution of trace fossils found in the sand displays the behavior of the earth vertebrates and how their lives changed over a long period of time. Additional biogeological investigations are needed to refine the paleoecological setting of the Middleton Formation. A fossil site containing one adult and two juvenile dinosaurs was uncovered in southwest Montana. These fossils were found buried in sediment inside of a burrow, and these particular fossils belong to Erectodromius cubicularis, which is potentially the first evidence for burrowing behavior in a dinosaur. Erectodromius cubicularis is a new genus and species of Hypsilophodon. The burrow, shown in the figure to the right, could have simply been a death trap or feeding grounds of a scavenger, but evidence points to Abicularis being the digger of this particular burrow. The dotted circle in the figure to the right shows a cross-section of the burrow, and the cross-sectional area can be used to help researchers determine if Erectodromius did in fact dig this particular burrow. The researchers used an allometric equation which compared the cross-sectional area of a burrow to the body mass of its These fossils also provide anatomical evidence for digging. 
The snout and pelvis of this particular fossil are two features which fall in line with other digging vertebrae. Shown below in the figure are large areas of muscle attachment around the shoulder and spine which allowed for increased strength in the shoulders and arms which would have been necessary for the constant digging. This discovery is truly exciting because it is the first trace of burrowing ever discovered relating to a dinosaur and in this particular case the fossil was found inside of its own trace fossil. In 2011, paleontologists made an incredible trace fossil discovery. Sandwiched between quartz and silica samples in rock formations located in Western Australia, an area known for impressive Lagerstätten, trace fossils of Earth's earliest life forms were found. Due to the use of technological processes such as electron microscopy, ion probe analysis, and mass spectrometry, the chemical behaviors of these microfossils can be mapped out. Paleontologists have dated this bacteria as far back as 3.4 billion years old in the Archaean making these fossils the oldest known to mankind. What this discovery means is that we can now start research on the biological activity of Earth's earliest life forms, thus connecting the dots of the evolution of organic development. These microfossils are considered legitimate trace fossils for various reasons. First, they were preserved well enough for paleontologists to determine the chemical markers and behavior of the bacteria. As opposed to body fossils, which show the remains of organisms' bodies, the microfossils found in Western Australia demonstrate their biological activity. For instance, paleontologists have been able to determine that this bacteria metabolized sulfur for sustenance during a time when oxygen was not present in the Earth's atmosphere during the Archaean. Furthermore, we can compare and contrast this biological process to modern-day bacteria. What we have found is that structurally, the microfossils and present-day bacteria are quite similar. However, they differ in the manner in which they sustain themselves. The implications that these trace fossils carry indicate that there may be further insight into the chemical behavior and activity of ancient microfossils. Having discovered the quality of preservation due to silica, we can assume that there may be more trace fossils out there that may help give insight into the chemical activity of this bacteria and potentially different fossilized bacteria like it. These future discoveries can help paleontologists piece together the puzzle that is life in the Archaean. These diagrams show the bacteria samples from the rock formations. They show clusters and chains of cells, folding of cells, and how the cells are attached to the quartz and silica rocks. As you can see, the structure of this bacteria is quite like the bacteria that exists on Earth today. By comparing the structures and functions of these microfossils, paleontologists will be able to determine the chemical processes of Earth's earliest life forms and hopefully delve deeper into the realms of bacterial microfossils. Having already discovered the manner in which this bacteria maintained itself, paleontologists may be able to determine further biological nuances and internal processes of these microfossils, as well as their effect on their respective ecosystems. What these findings tell us is that life existed as far back as the early Archaean. In addition, there are organisms that metabolize sulfur in order to prosper in severe conditions. What more can be discovered of these organisms? How did they interact with other organisms? How did they interact with similar bacteria? How did they impact their surrounding environments? This behavioral analysis can aid in figuring out the chemical progression and evolution of early life forms. With these discoveries, it is essential that paleontologists keep digging to find out more about the mysteries of early life here on Earth.
Trace fossils are crucial to learning about the fossil record. Without them, the fossil record would have far more inconsistencies and holes that would otherwise be vacant. Trace fossils have taught the world about our past, and there is still much more to be discovered.